Sandeep, absolutely delighted that you agreed to come uh, to, to the JLF here at New York. Um, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, we're sort of fascinated in recent times with the amount of writing that's been coming out of the medical profession, and not just academic writing, but really writing that's accessible and is, being, as, and is taking the medical profession itself, sort of opening it up to both question uh, and understanding in many ways. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's one effort, certainly everybody who's ill goes to Google and tries to figure out what's happened to them. But I think books like these really help in being able to dispel much of um, the myth behind uh, medicine and, and whatever. Your own, your own story um, in this has been absolutely fascinating. And I Thank you. Wanted, you, wanted you to start by telling us a little bit, I mean, you know, much of it was sort of uh, your fascination with heart or your fascination perhaps with death began not necessarily in your immediate time, but 15 or 16 years earlier when one of your, uh, I think your paternal grandfather passed away that's right. from supposed snake bite. Tell yeah. us about that. Right, so, uh, so I grew up in a family where uh, my father's grief over his father's premature sudden death when my father was uh, not even 14 years old sort of suffused the home. You know, he, he, he always thought about it, talked about it. Um, I never got a chance to meet my paternal grandfather. Uh, but the story, like many kind of stories um, of family death, was kind of uh, soaked in myth and, um, and, and sort of family lore. And the, the, the story was that, that my paternal grandfather, uh, first of all, uh, emigrated uh, you know, out of Pakistan, uh, 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 at the partition and uh, moved the family to Kanpur and um, really struggled um, in those early years to get a footing and, and establish um, a storefront. So he was in that storefront uh, on the day that he died. He moved a sack of rice and the story is that there was a snake, uh, a cobra. Uh, and we, they know it was a cobra because afterwards uh, some neighbors went and killed the snake and actually brought it to my grandfather uh, who was having lunch and he had been bitten and when he saw the snake he said oh oh my god how am I going to survive this and he slumped onto the floor and um, and went unconscious so the family didn't know what to do um, and he essentially remained that way for several hours uh, they called, you know, sort of the doctors, but uh, no one really knew what had happened. Then finally they flagged down an ambulance that used to uh, uh, sort of circulate through the town. And uh, they insisted that the ambulance take my grandfather uh, and the snake to a hospital, uh, Hallett Hospital, it was a British built hospital. And uh, the doctor there immediately told my family that my grandfather not, had not, in fact, uh, died of a snake bite uh, because a snake, bite, a snake bite or snake venom wouldn't work so quickly, that he had, in fact, died of a heart attack. Um, so uh, this kind of tragedy really um, just immersed the whole family into a lot of grief, you know, at, at, at that time, probably still in India, you know, to be a widow is a is such, it, it's, it's one of the most difficult sort of social roles to assume. And um, so, you know, my grandmother suffered, my father suffered also. Um, so we, we always talked about it. And so I used to think of the heart as this kind of supernatural object. You know, here was a man who was sort of doing okay and then suddenly died. Right? So the heart was really the only organ in the body that could kill you suddenly. Right? Cancer kills slowly, relatively slowly. Uh, and so I would think of the heart as this, you know, the executioner of men, mostly men, at least that's what I thought, now we know differently, uh, in the prime of their lives. 
And so I used to lie in bed and, you know, look up at the ceiling fan and kind of listen to my heartbeat, you know, in my ear and try to time, you know, the... He used to put the regulator trying to make sure that the fan regulation was sort of according to his heartbeat yeah. that he felt in the pillow when he put his ear to it. Exactly. So there, there were those kinds of things. But so, you know, I, th I think the family history was a big part of it. Um, but then, you know, the other sort of large part of it was that the heart um, it, it, it is so metaphorized in our society. There's probably no other object in the universe that carries so much symbolism, right? The heart is the container of the emotions. It's the seat of the soul. It's the locus of courage. It's the locus of love. And so, um, you know, what was this organ all about? So I would think about it when I was a child and, and uh, whenever I had a chance to do you know, science experiments, I would, you know, sort of do it on... Let's hold that. But yes. We'll come back to that. You know, you yeah. talked about uh, how difficult it was for um, uh, widows uh, or women uh, when they lost their husbands. Yes. Of course, we have merry widows as well, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, more so here than any anywhere else, and, of course, yes. in India as well. But one of the most fascinating things, actually, in your book is when you look at heartbreak and, you know, talking about talking about that. And what does heartbreak do to your heart? And then the kind of studies that you talked about yeah. as to how the heart actually distends. And tell us a little bit about the actual, yeah. what happens to the heart for heartbreak. Right. So I, I, I wrote a piece in this past Sunday's New York Times about, uh, about heartbreak. Uh, and it's adapted uh, from my book. Um, but it's fascinating that that this entity that we refer to as heartbreak actually has a sort of biological manifestation. Um, and uh, we know today, based on research over the really relatively recently, the last two decades, that intense emotional distress can acutely weaken the heart. Now, we don't know why. We don't know why the heart assumes the shape that it does. And it assumes it a distinctive shape. Um, it's called a takasubo. And, you know, the heart is um, kind of shaped like, like a, a bit like an inverted pyramid, um, you know, the way it sort of sits in the, in the chest. But what happens during intense heartbreak in, 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 in takasubo cardiomyopathy is that um, the heart balloons out at its apex and it sort of shrinks at its base and it looks like a Japanese octopus trapping pot called a takasubo, and that's why it was named takasubo cardiomyopathy. This is a condition that was really um, identified only about maybe two or three decades ago, and really the research has um, been relatively, you know, over the last decade or so. Um, and it was initially identified because they did autopsy studies of people who had been attacked um, either physically or uh, emotionally, um, and had died. And what they found was that, and, but they didn't die of the physical attack per se. And what they found when they autopsied their hearts is that the hearts had sort of telltale signs of cell death and necrosis. And so that led to more investigation. And you know, I'd say every year, probably, I have at least a dozen patients, um, maybe more, uh, if I include all the doctors in my practice, maybe two dozen patients, mostly women, for reasons we don't really understand, who will suffer some sort of heartbreak. Typically, it's after a romantic breakup, but it can be after the death of a loved one, the death of a spouse. And um, they develop acute congestive heart failure. They get chest pains. Uh, they, their, their neck veins get distended. They get short of breath. Fluid fills their lungs. And but there's really nothing kind of physically wrong with the plumbing in their hearts. Like if we take pictures, there are no blockages anywhere. And so this is the Takasuba cardiomyopathy. Fortunately, it tends to resolve, but in, um, I'd say, a uh, not insignificant proportion of cases, it can lead to death. 
So, so, so Sandeep, staying with the heart, you, you know, it's such a fascinating thing. The heart has sort of played its role in all the, the popular myths, everything from the Egyptian hieroglyphics, where uh, that's the only organ that they continue to keep in the body, and they said that that's what the person will take forward into the next life. And it, I think it was only in the 13th century that there's some writings that came out of Persia when they talked about um, uh, the place of the heart being central to the blood, etc. And then, moving forward, you then came to the 16th, 17th century where that again started. So tell us a little bit about how that progression and why did it take so long in medical history, as you've written, for people to discover the actual seat of this incredible yeah. pump uh, yes. uh, yeah. in our body. Yeah, well, you call it a pump, but people didn't want to think of it as a pump. There were cultural prohibitions to investigating the heart in a medical or scientific way. Uh, so, you know, the Greeks thought of the heart as sort of a, um, the central locus of the emotions, the soul, um, uh, I believe Plato thought of it as a sentry that was a sort of guard that would warn of, um, of uh, uh, events uh, that might be detrimental to the body. Um, and so uh, th there were these m sort of metaphorical misconceptions, frankly, about what the heart was about. And this lasted for... Um, a long time, I mean, uh, over uh, a millennia. Uh, so um, several, millennia, several millennia, actually. So it wasn't until uh, about 1600 or so when uh, William Harvey, who was an English anatomist, po posed the, sort of posited the idea that the heart um, what pumped blood, and he sort of invented the theory of circulation. <clears throat> and the ideas prior were that, that, um, that the liver made uh, blood and that the, the blood circulated through the body and was consumed as a, as a nutrient. The idea that the blood actually circulates and, and isn't consumed was um, really sacrilegious. And Harvey actually wrote um, in his papers, uh, he actually waited almost 20 years to publish. Um, and he wrote in his papers that he was afraid for his life. And he should have been afraid because another guy uh, had similar thoughts and was burned at the stake. Uh, Mich Michel Servetus, um, probably about 50 years earlier. So uh, as soon as the idea that the heart circulated the blood and the blood wasn't consumed sort of came into the fore, then a massive amount of progress uh, was made. Your own interest uh, in, in this whole heart thing, uh, began, of course, with this history with your grandfather, but in your very first experiment where you had got very interested and you decided that that's going to be your, your sort of school project, and there you go off to a pond, you scrape the bottom, you pick up six frogs or six odd frogs and come back home, and what happens? Yeah, so I, uh, I decided to measure the electrical signal from uh, a frog's heart. And my... What age was this? How old so, were you? Uh, so I was... a junior in high school, but I, I had been moved up, so I think I was 14 or 15. Um, and so I got on my bike, I went to the pond, I gathered up the frogs, um, and I stored them, and, um, uh, and then when it came time, I got out a dissection tray, and I, um, and you know, the, the way I had to do it, the, the heart had to be beating. So, but if you cut open the frog, um, very likely the heart will stop. So what you have to do is actually pith the frog, which is to sever the spinal cord so it, it, it can't move. Um, so I did that, and just in the course of it, I broke into tears. I, I, I couldn't do it. I was very um, just, it was just, I was just emotionally um, just wrought by the whole experience. And one of the frogs at one point escaped uh, after, climbed out, climbed out, or slithered out yeah, of the tree. After being cut open, it was it was horrible. Um, and and in, in the end, I, I I tried to get the signal, and I, in 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 my panic, I forgot to disconnect the voltage source that the leads were attached to, and the leads basically exploded, exploded the frog, and uh, 
and then I had really had no data. So anyway, I wrote this paper that, that where I had no data. And, um, but I remember when I was crying, um, my mother came out, and she kind of looked at the whole scene, and she immediately figured out what was going on. And she said um, something like, you know, um, tera del bo chota hai. You know, your, your, your heart is too small for this. And what she meant by small wasn't that I was stingy, or, but it, it was just that I, um, I couldn't cope with that kind of um, aggression. Uh, and, Emotion. And, yeah. And so, um, you in know, fact, and I carried fact, that with me. In fact, fast life. forwarding, when you actually got to your first cadaver and it was lying open and you had to you know, reach out to yeah. do your hard thing. Yeah. Would tell us a little bit yeah, I, about I mean, how I, that happened. I this also, is now, you know, many years later, medical school, internship, and he's there with yeah. the doctor on duty uh, yeah. trying to get at his first heart. Yeah, right. So, the, well, so when I was in medical school, I dissected a cadaver, and I was, I was actually very interested, uh, you know, in the heart. Um, and I wasn't so interested in the rest of the dissection, so I would watch a lot of the dissection, but when it came to the heart, uh, you know, I really wanted to, um, to, to participate. And I remember uh, cutting open the, um, the, what's called the left anterior descending artery. It's the main artery that supplies blood to the left ventricle, which is the main part of the heart, and cut into it, and, and the scalpel, there was something pushing back on the scalpel. It was like this hard grit. And, and I immediately thought of my grandfather and uh, you know, what his coronary arteries must have been like and what my own coronary arteries must be since I carry you know, the, you know, this, the, the genetic predisposition to heart disease. It wasn't just my paternal grandfather, but my maternal grandfather died uh, of, of a heart attack and my mother um, also uh, passed away from a heart attack. So, so uh, you know, it was... Uh, you know, it was really a real process of, of discovery. How did you get interested in actually writing this particular book? You know, I mean, there were a lot of, I mean, the, the family, the sort of malignant family history was one thing. Um, the sort of the, the, the cultural currency that the heart carries um, was, was always sort of big in my mind and sort of motivated me. Um, you know, the fact that that more people die of heart disease in the world than any other disease, right? So 18 million people die of heart disease every year, uh, and a large number, a dis disproportionate number, are in South Asia. The South Asians have some of the most malignant heart disease in the world. Uh, and so that has always been a part of my thinking. Um, and then, you know, the more you discover about the heart, the, the more you realize what an absolutely fascinating organ it is. So, um, you know, when we think of um, uh, the brain, right, the mind, it's very hard to use our own minds to change our way of thinking, right? It's very hard to be self-referential. Our eyes, right, we can't see our own eyes, but the heart is unique in that the heart actually pumps blood not just to the rest of the body, but to itself. So in a sense, it's self-sustaining. And when you think of the massive amount of work it does, it beats three billion times in a typical human lifetime. Um, if the heart, just the, your, your own heart were beating for a week, it, it could empty uh, a swimming pool. Um, so the amount of work it does is absolutely uh, mind-boggling. Um, and but. Some of the unique properties make it such a challenge medically. First of all, the heart is filled with blood. So if you want to cut it open, uh, you'll bleed to death, right? So, so that was a big challenge. In fact, the heart stood alone of all organs in the body um, as late as the early 20th century for never being operated on. The brain had been operated on, the liver, the kidneys, everything, not the heart. And why? Because of what I'm saying. The heart's filled with blood. If you cut it open, you bleed. And you can bleed very quickly. Within a minute, you could die. If you stop the heart and empty it of blood, then you get brain damage, right? Because there's no blood circulating through the body. 
So how you circumvent that problem was a huge challenge, probably one of the biggest challenges that medicine has ever faced. And a portion of the book is devoted to how doctors and scientists overcame that challenge. In fact, what's, what's fascinating in the book is one of the, one of the first scientific experiments that happened where this doctor looked at a pregnant or an expecting mother and he looks at how the, the child's blood is circulated through the heart, reoxygenated, carbon dioxide is taken out and it goes back. And that leads him to the first experiment where he gets two dogs uh, together and Tell us how that sort of yeah. happened. Right, so everyone knew that to cut open the heart, uh, you would have to use some sort of heart-lung machine, right? So you'd have to have a machine that, it, through which the blood circulated, got oxygen, was cleaned of waste, and then went back into the body while the heart was stopped, right? That was the only way to do it. but. Uh, one of the most innovative surgeons of the 20th century, uh, a guy named Walt Lillehei, who worked in the Midwest in Minneapolis, um, was thought about um, uh, a pregnant mother, right? So um, a fetus can't breathe, right? Because it's, it's, it's floating in fluid, can't take a breath. So a fetus receives all its oxygen and has all its waste cleaned by its mother. So Lillehei reasoned well, what if I took a child that needed heart surgery, stopped the child's heart, hooked up the child to his parent, had the parent's and child's blood, obviously the blood types would have to be the same, circulate through the child, supplying blood to the child's uh, brain and other major organs while the child's heart was actually stopped and cut open and fixed. So that, that technique that he proposed was called cross-circulation. And you can only imagine um, the uproar in the medical community when he proposed that. People said, this is the first operation in human history that could kill two people. Uh, and, but Lillehei was a very interesting man. He, uh, he, you know, without getting into all the details, but he was a cancer survivor, and, um, and he wasn't afraid of death. Uh, and he took risks, and, and, uh, and frankly, he risked his patients' lives because he knew that they were going to die anyway. Um, and so he did some of these uh, operations with the cross-circulation cross technique, and in fact, his outcomes were better than the outcomes if these children had not been operated on. Um, eventually, his cross-circulation technique was supplanted by the heart-lung machine. But, um, uh, uh, but he, he, he worked on this for several years. In fact, for several years, he was the only surgeon in the world who was doing open heart surgery th with this technique. Again, I know we're sort of trying to get us to open it up to the couple of quick questions. The first time that, that the doctor sort of decided that he would put a probe into the heart was fascinating because he then, uh, he did this ruse where he had this patient uh, come out, but you know, blindfolded her, etc. But he then decided that, or well, that was his plan, that he used the equipment instead to insert the, the, this thing through his uh, uh, arteries into the heart. And that yes. was the first time a probe went directly into the heart, and it was right. Uh, right. medical so, history. Yeah, well, he won a Nobel Prize, but uh, he was a German intern, actually. Um, he must have been about 26, 27 years old. Um, so he told a nurse that he had this idea that, that he was going to insert a catheter into her vein, push it up into her heart, and, uh, and take a picture. And uh, apparently she said, OK. <laughs> Uh, she was in love with him. Yes, there, there, there must have why. been some uh, relationship. <laughs> but, um, uh, but she said, OK, as she wanted to be there when he made medical history. But um, what he actually wanted from her, what, because she uh, had the, the key to the supply closet, and he knew that he needed a certain length of catheter. So what, what, uh, and he used a bladder catheter, catheters you know, for, for the urine, because there was no cardiac catheter. Uh, and so he got her to open up the closet, and, and he tied her down. 
and uh, uh, and blindfolded onto him. a gurney, and then um, and then he made the incision on himself, uh, and he, he actually needed her to once he got the catheter in to help him take an X-ray, and he knew he knew he needed help, so he cut open his own uh, uh, arm Wait. and inserted the catheter the catheter the tube plastic tube into his vein and push it up to his heart and then actually walk downstairs to the x-ray room and, and, and took a picture and it made medical history and tw uh, actually he, uh, he, people ignored it for a while. They thought this was just crazy. They had no idea what, what this meant and, um, and he decided to b bail out of um, medicine and he became a urologist. Uh, and he went into private practice, and then American doctors discovered what he had done and used it to study all sorts of amazing things about the heart and the heart's physiology. And then when they got the Nobel Prize, Werner Forsman, the German doctor, who was sort of plucked out of obscurity and given the Nobel Prize, and he said, I feel like a deacon at the, um, you know, <laughs> you know, at the local church. I mean, he, he, he had no... Uh, he had no idea that this was going to happen. And but what he had done during that whole period is he used to take bits, many bits of his veins and sort of you know, cut them up and start doing all sorts of things with the groin and the arm. He did it multiple, multiple times until all his Vidushi veins is telling scarred. us it's zero minutes, but I'm going to quickly, I'm not going to go into the heart-lung machine, which of course was very fascinating, but very quickly into the first a transplant, because yes. that became again, you know, the heart was arriving, the plane failed, they had to land somewhere, and you know, that patient yeah. died. Yeah. Great, great drama. We now take it for granted that something happens, we get wheeled into hospital, it all gets sorted out, but at that point of time, it was extraordinary. So, just yeah, yeah. So, uh, the, the, f the first human heart transplant was done, you know, of course, by Christian Barnard in South Africa, and it was a sort of epoch making surgery. Um, but the, the doctors who knew the most about transplant were in America, but the American doctors couldn't easily do a heart transplant because American doctors at the time had a uh, very uh, restricted notion of death, that the death could only occur when the heart stopped. Well, if the heart stops, like I told you, the heart pumps blood to itself. If it stops, the heart gets what's called ischemic damage. It just, it, it, uh, it, it gets damaged irreparably. So what Barnard had was he advocated for a different definition of death called brain death, that, that you could have, you could declare someone dead if sufficient parts of the brain were, were dead, uh, even if the heart was still beating. And so he did his first operation on an unfortunate woman who was hit by a truck crossing a road. She developed brain death. And so he was the one who did the first surgery, even though um, the American doctors were far, far more advanced in their research. Last question. You know, you're talking about brain dead. My mother, I brought, it up, I brought up my parents very well, and I used to tell them, you know, on these days, I'm, I'm going to America for JLF or whatever, so if you're going to die, just hang in there. And that's what she did. She went brain dead, but she waited for me to come back from Boulder, Colorado, and then her heart gave away. On the Saturday that I said that, I would come back. So, you know, I was very fortunate. Because I should tell them, weekends are the best time, you know, to pass away because, you know, you can go to the funeral and do all of that stuff. But important. Similar, you know, situation happened with your mother. But when you look at the heart today and the, the amount of um, incredible work that's been done in its research, do we know everything that there is to know about it? And, in that knowing, if you look at America, where the incidence of heart disease is so enormous, partly to food, partly to the environment, are there solutions to be able to manage the situation outside of medical intervention, or is that bus long yeah. left? I mean, there's so much we don't understand about the heart, and so much that uh, technology has gotten us very far. But uh, the fact is that cardiac mortality, um, even though it's been on the decline, has slowed down significantly. So one of the points I advocate in my book is that we need to start paying more attention to our emotional lives and our emotional hearts. Um, in, in sort of ironically, I think the field needs to shift back a thousand years to when the heart actually was the locus of the emotions. Because we know that emotional distress, relationships, 
unhappy marriages, um, difficult relationships uh, at, at, at work, in the workplace, all these things have tremendous ramifications and, and affect our hearts in very adverse ways. So one of the, the, and not just on the individual level, but on a social level, we need to address some of the things that really affect people. Uh, we know that um, uh, underprivileged communities suffer from horrendous rates of heart disease. Uh, communities that are beset with you know, racism or uh, income inequality or um, you know, uh, you know, financial distress. So I think that we need to focus a lot more on that. Um, at the same time, we need to celebrate how far we've come uh, with technology. Thank you. And uh, very quickly, a couple of questions from the house. Namita. In India, in Urdu poetry, in some med, uh, sort of traditions, the seat of the emotions is the jigger or the liver, not the heart. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Um, I mean, has know, this struck you? Has it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the liver um, has had uh, ha has has had s sort of metaphorical uh, meanings attached to it over over the years. Uh, in Persia, for example, in India. Um, but if you look sort of cross-culturally and over the years, most cultures subscribe to the idea that, that emotion or emotional lives are contained within the heart. But yeah, that's an interesting sort of metaphor. He does refer to some of it in the book, et cetera. Yeah. Anybody? Go ahead. I've often come across articles that talk about um, pet owners living longer lives, and I'm kind of curious as to your opinion on that. Well, I just got a puppy, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was told by the, the person who sold me the puppy that, um, that uh, we'll live longer, um, and that, that dogs lower blood pressure and do all sorts of salutary things. And, and I, I'll tell you that my family's all very happy, you know, <laughs> ever since we got the puppy. So, um, you know, I, I don't know too much about it, but I, I, I do think that, that ways in which we lower our stress, and in the modern world, stress is everywhere. Um, and, uh, and especially, I'm starting to see now, now that I have, t you know, a teenager, in young people, horrible amounts of, uh, of, of stress that are probably related to social media, but really, you know, in, things that I don't quite understand. Um, but I, I, I do think that anything that we can do to improve our relationships and, um, and lower our, uh, our stress hormones will be you know, beneficial to our heart health. So, so how exactly, I mean, sorry, last question. How exactly does it, if you were able to remove stress, so what effect does stress actually have on the heart? What happens? Is it your artery is thicken or what's the effect? We, Medically. Know, we don't really know, I mean, like for example, with acute stress, like the Takasubo cardiomyopathy, we don't really know why it happens. What's interesting is that Takasubo, a kind of Takasubo cardiomyopathy also happens after a happy event, like a surprise birthday party. But what's fascinating about that is that the heart changes into a different shape. It doesn't change into the Takasubo shape, it changes into a totally different shape. Why? I don't know. God knows. But, uh, but, I, but I would say that, um, that the effect of chronic stress um, is different than acute stress like Takasubo. Chronic stress um, uh, activates hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, other things that, that can have toxic effects on the heart and can increase the risk of developing you know, um, hardening of the arteries. And the other most fascinating thing in the book is, you know, that you have the most chance of dying between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, past a REM deep sleep. But read, more, we'll read about it here and know more about this. Thank you very much, Dr. Johar, for this absolutely fascinating piece of work. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. And he will be signing, uh, he will be signing outside. So do go and pick up a copy of this book and read it. Take it home. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was absolutely Thank you. fascinating.